Pastor Bertrand Compare. We had been starting to talk about the gospel and the stars. The signs of the zodiac, not as the pagans tried to mix them up and not as the astrologers give their foolish stories about them, but to show that from the beginning, even among the pagans, they recognized these constellations in the sky as having a significance which actually makes no sense under any of the pagan religions, but is a setting forth in the sky of the things that are the essentials of the Christian religion. Now, I think the most foolish nonsense ever spoken is the idea that any of these constellations or planets influence your character or abilities according to what one was rising at the hour of your birth. I give no credence to it at all. And that is not the idea I'm talking about. <coughs> what I have in mind is this, that from the earliest times, among these pagan peoples even, they all had a uniform system for this. They divided the circle of sky around the earth along roughly the path taken by the sun and the moon as they go around the earth. They divided it into 12 major divisions, each of which was named after a principal constellation within that segment of the sky. And also in each of these sectors there were several minor constellations. And practically all the ancient civilizations agreed upon the names which they gave to these constellations. Now with the one exception of Scorpio, which does look like what it's named after, the rest of the constellations bear not the faintest resemblance to the thing they were named after. As I said, the wildest nightmares of a drunken maniac couldn't figure out from the pattern of the stars anything resembling the things that they were called as constellations of the zodiac. And yet, with nothing to suggest from the way the stars are placed that this is what it should be, here, even these pagan ancient empires all had substantially the same names for these constellations. Now what it comes down to is this. It's quite obvious that in the third chapter of Genesis, God gave more information to Adam and Eve than is recorded in just Genesis 3 verse 15 where, of course, the first promise of the coming Redeemer, Jesus Christ, is found. Where God said I, to Satan, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And the same Hebrew word zera for seed or descendants was used in both cases. So Satan was to have just as literal seed as was Eve. And he goes on, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. Thou shalt bruise his heel, and he shall bruise, or some translations say crush, thy head. Now you find a long gap from there on before you get any more prophecy you run into a couple of thousand years. Now what was to keep all this alive? We know, of course, that God told Eve that this promised descendant of hers who would crush or bruise Satan's head would be God himself coming as one of her descendants. Because, and here again it's concealed in the mistranslation of your King James Version, you read that Eve bore Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. But in the Hebrew she says, I have gotten a man, even Yahweh. In other words, 
like all of us, wishing for the accomplishment of all this sooner than it came, she thought, well, one of my descendants is to be God himself in human form, so here's my descendant, this is the one. Well, we know, of course, that wasn't the case with Cain. But she couldn't have made that kind of a blunder if she hadn't been told that the one of her seed who was going to crush the head of Satan would be God himself. Again, of course, we know that the significance of the blood sacrifice was explained because Abel brought the blood sacrifice, which was accepted, and Cain didn't, and his was rejected. And we're told in the book of Hebrews that by faith, Abel brought a more perfect sacrifice than Cain. Now, you can't have faith in something you've never heard. Well, obviously, to keep all this from being lost in the centuries when prophecy was not available, someone, and the ancient traditions say that it was Seth and Enoch, someone figured out a way to call these various constellations after things which would remind you of what was to be more fully explained eventually in the Bible. Now, the last time we looked through these constellations, we saw that to make any sense out of it, you've got to begin with Virgo, the woman. Then you go on through the next one, Libra, the scales, Scorpio, Sagittarius, the centaur archer, Capricornus, the goat, and Aquarius, the water bearer, pouring out the water of life. Now let's go on to the seventh of these signs of the zodiac, Pisces, the fishes. Now, despite the fact that the stars don't themselves outline any such pattern, you find in many ancient temples upon a wall or upon a ceiling, they have drawn out the whole zodiac with the figures outlined <coughs> there. Now, the fishes, it shows two large fishes at practically right angles to each other. And there is a broad ribbon or band, one end tied around the tail of each of these two fishes and quite a long slack in this band, and the middle of it, where it's doubled, is shown fastened to the neck of a sea monster. Now, of these two fishes, with the band fastened to their tail, one of them is trying to swim north toward the pole star. He's looking up. The other one at right angles along the plane of the ecliptic. You remember that among our people always there have been some who were looking up to God for guidance and for the permanent life that's to come. Others who are materialists and quite content with the present situation as long as they can get along in some fashion in it. And so they're shown here. In the zodiac on the ceiling of the Egyptian temple at Dendera, this sign has marked beside it the Egyptian name Picot Orion, the fishes of him who is coming. Now, why fish? Well, not merely because they were an important item of food, but uh, of all useful creatures anyway, fish multiply faster than any others. It only takes a little while for a few fish to become a great shoal or school of fish. And you remember one thing always promised to our people was that the nation of Israel should become very numerous. And fishes were a symbol of rapid multiplication. 
It's worth noting, incidentally, that a fish was also the first symbol adopted by the early Christians. The cross was not used for a couple of hundred years afterward. But they adopted a fish. As Remember that uh, Christ said to one of his disciples, I will make you fishers of men. Now the rapid multiplication, Jeremiah 30 verse 19, I will multiply them and they shall not be few. I will also glorify them and they shall not be small. Ezekiel 36 verses 10 and 11, I will multiply men upon you, all the house of Israel, even all of it, and the city shall be inhabited and the waste shall be builded. And I will multiply upon you man and beast, and they shall increase and bring fruit. Now this band or ribbon with which these fish were tied was always recognized among the ancients as a separate constellation in itself from the two fish. The Egyptian name for it, who are he cometh. The Arabic name, Al-Risha, the band. Now as I say, the middle of this band is shown fastened to the neck of Cetus, the sea monster, and immediately above is the constellation Andromeda, a woman captive in chains. Now the Greeks elaborated considerably on that with their legend, there was this seaport city where fishing was a very important part of their way of making a living. And this sea monster came along and scared away all the fish and the town was in a bad way. So they decided the only thing they could do was offer a human sacrifice to this sea monster. So they chose among their people this woman Andromeda and they chained her to a rock out in the sea. And uh, you remember that uh, the hero Perseus came along and rescued Andromeda from that in the Greek legend. Well, you can trust the Greeks, of course, to get everything botched up and wrong that they touch upon. The Greeks had a sort of form of religion but few of the Greeks, and uh, nothing can be said for the morals of the ancient Greeks, but few of the Greeks were as bad as the gods they worshipped, so they didn't take their religion very seriously. And any poet who wanted to write an epic poem about the doing of their gods was free to do so. There was nothing sacred about it. After all, a bunch of thieves, murderers, uh, drunkards, uh, what have you, if those are all you've got for gods, it's hard to find anything sacred in it. <clears throat> so when it comes to these Greek legends, while you can wonder where the Greeks got the germ of the idea and trace it back somewhere, don't expect to find any truth expressed in any of the Greek legends. Now, the significance, of course, of this you remember the Bible often speaks of Israel as a personified as a woman, the daughter of Zion. Well, Israel was taken into captivity more than once, you remember, and held captive until delivered by the Redeemer. The Hebrew name of this constellation Andromeda is Sirah, the chain. The brightest star in Andromeda is called Al-Firatz, the broken down. The next brightest, Mira, meaning the weak, and the third, Adil, the afflicted. Well, now that's a situation in which the nation of Israel was left on more than one occasion, you remember. And God got her out of it from time to time. <clears throat> but listen now to the Bible references to this, which show what this was intended to mean. Isaiah 54, verses 11 to 13. O thou afflicted, 
tossed with tempest and not comforted? Behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors and thy foundations with sapphires. I will make thy windows of agates and thy gates of carbuncles and all thy borders of pleasant stones. And all thy children shall be taught by Yahweh and great shall be the peace of thy children. Again, Isaiah 52, verses 1 to 3. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. Shake thyself from the dust. Arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus saith Yahweh, Ye have sold yourselves for naught, and ye shall be redeemed without money. Now right near to the constellation Andromeda is another bearing the Greek name Cephus, the king. In the zodiac at the temple of Dendera in Egypt, it bears the name Pekuhor, meaning this one is coming to rule. Cephus, the Greek name, is really derived from the Hebrew scythe, which means branch. And you remember the several references to Jesus Christ as the branch. The brightest star in Cephus is Alderamin, meaning coming quickly. The next, Alphurk, the Redeemer, and the third brightest, which is in the left knee of the figure, al Rai, who bruises or breaks. You remember, he shall bruise thy head. The eighth constellation in this series of twelve of the zodiac is Aries, the ram. The ancient Hebrews called it Tale, meaning the lamb. The Arabic name was al-Hamal, the sheep. But if you go way back to the ancient Akkadians, their name, Bara Zigar. Now, Bar meant altar or sacrifice, and Zigar making right. So, Bara Zigar, the sacrifice of righteousness. And you remember that a sheep was offered as the sacrifice. It's worthy of note the names given to the two brightest stars. Now these names are very ancient. And even today, about 150 of the brightest stars in the heavens are still known to astronomers by their ancient Hebrew or Arab Arabic names. The brightest star in Aries, in the forehead of this figure, the ram, called El Naf, or some of the Arabic writers called it El Natik. The wounded, or the slain one. The next brightest in the left horn, Al Sheratan, the bruised. Now, at the time of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the day of the crucifixion, the 14th day of the Hebrew month Nisan, the sun was in this sign Aries and practically at the point occupied by these two brightest stars. How's that for calling your shots 4,000 years ahead of time? In this sector named after Aries the ram, nearby and somewhat above Aries is the constellation Cassiopeia. In all these ancient zodiacs, this is shown as a woman seated on a throne. Her right hand is drawing a scarf over her shoulder. Her left hand holds a branch, and with her left hand she's arranging her hair. She is very close beside Cephus, the king. Now the Arabic name of this constellation Cassiopeia, El Seder, the freed. 
a very ancient name, was Daughter of Splendor. The Chaldee name, Dat al Kursa, the enthroned. Now you remember that the nation of Israel is promised that she will be the bride of Christ, bride of the king. Now let's see what Isaiah says about this. Isaiah 62, verses 3 to 5. Thou shalt be a crown of beauty in the hand of Yahweh, and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate. But thou shalt be called Hephzibah, which means my delight is in her. And thy land shall be called Beulah, meaning married. For Yahweh delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be married. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy restorer marry thee. Your King James, mistranslated as always, says, so shall thy sons marry thee which, of course, is an absurdity and contrary to Bible law. So shall thy restorer marry thee, and as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. Now going on to constellation number nine, Taurus, the bull. With the exception of the Egyptians, all the ancients, called this the bull. The Chaldean name, Taur. Arabic, al -thor. Greek, Tauros. Latin, Taurus, all meaning the bull. In the Dendera zodiac, the name written beside it is Apis, the head or chief. The Hebrew name, Shur, comes from a root with a double meaning both coming and ruling. In all the zodiacs, Taurus is shown as a charging bull, head lowered and those great sharp horns thrust forward. The brightest star in Taurus is Aldebaran, meaning the leader or the governor. The next in the tip of the left horn, El Naf, slain. Within the huge outlines of Taurus, you find also the smaller constellation of the Pleiades, the constellation of the ruler or the judge. Now, I've told you about some of the remarkable things in the Great Pyramid. The fact that in the mathematics of its design, you find astronomical mathematics that our greatest scientists didn't know enough about it to verify until within our own lifetime. So that obviously those were matters of inspiration at the time the pyramid was made. Well now the names given to some of these stars also show inspiration. The brightest star in the Pleiades is called Alcyone, which means the center. Now, you've all seen pictures of spiral galaxies, those great clouds of scores or hundreds of millions of stars that so often are scattered in the form of a great pinwheel across the sky. And you know that our Earth is in a galaxy which appears to us in the sky as the Milky Way. That's one of these great pinwheels, and our solar system is located about two-thirds of the way from the center to the outer rim of it. The whole shape of it is more or less lens-shaped, that is, thicker at the center and tapering off thin at the outer edges. It takes considerably over 200 million years for this galaxy to make one revolution. But as nearly as our astronomers can determine today, the center of gravity of the entire galaxy, which has 
I forget how many hundreds of millions of stars in it, the center of gravity about which our entire galaxy rotates is about at the position of this star Alcyone in the Pleiades. You remember Job was asked, Canst thou, what does it break the bands of Orion or loose the sweet influence of the Pleiades? Well, it is a sweet influence, all right, because if you didn't have some center of gravity about which these stars could move, you'd find them scattering in all directions with a good many collisions. But now back in those days, when there is not even a legend or a myth about anybody having a telescope, how did they find out about this? Well, we're still talking about this big constellation Taurus, the bull. Again, a symbol of the might of God's people Israel. They weren't the biggest nation. They were always running into others more numerous than themselves. But because God was the one who stood back of them and got them out of their difficulties, they had the power to smash many kingdoms. Deuteronomy 33, verse 17, speaking of the tribe of Ephraim, His glory is like the firstling of his bullock and his horns are like the horns of the wild ox. With them he shall push the peoples together to the ends of the earth, and they are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. Psalm 44, verse 5, adds a little more. Thou art my king, O God. Command deliverances for Jacob. Through thee will we push down our enemies. Through thy name will we tread them underfoot that rise up against us. In this same sector of the zodiac, and close to Taurus, is the constellation Orion. In the Dendera zodiac, the name given is Hagat, which in Egyptian means he who triumphs. And hieroglyphic characters written close to it read, Or. Now, we use this Greek word Orion, the name the Greeks gave to this thing, but it was anciently written Orion. It's derived from a Hebrew root meaning light. The Akkadian name, Urana, the light of heaven. The Hebrew, however, called the entire constellation Kessel the strong one, the hero. In all these zodiacs, Orion is shown as the figure of a mighty warrior. With his right hand, he's brandishing a club. With his outstretched left hand, he is grasping the head and skin of a slain lion. His left hand is planted firmly, his left foot, I should say, is planted firmly on the head of an enemy. And it's interesting to note, in his belt is a sword. And on the hilt of the sword, the pommel, the knob at the end of the hilt, is carved in the form of the head of a lamb. Now you don't think of that as a warlike emblem, except you remember what the Lamb of God is able to accomplish. Well, the lion skin and head, yeah, he was not only going to bruise Satan's head, he was going to skin him. <clears throat> In 1 Peter 5, verse 8, we're told, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about, seeking whom he may devour. The names of the stars in this constellation Orion are interesting again. The brightest star, which is in his right shoulder, Betelgeuse, the coming of the branch. Remember all your references in the Bible to the branch 
heart of Jesus Christ. The next brightest, in his left foot, which is over the head of his enemy, is the star Regal, the foot that crushes. The third brightest, in his left shoulder, Bellatrix, swiftly destroying. The fourth brightest, Alnatik, the wounded one. And another, down on the right leg, Saif, bruised. Remember, his heel would be bruised in the process of crushing Satan's head. Now this enemy he's conquering, that he's got his left foot firmly planted on, you find the Romans uh, messed this up a bit. They called this constellation Lepus, the hare. But it wasn't that way in any of the ancient constellations. That's just a Latin corruption. In the early Persian zodiac, it was a serpent. In the zodiac of the temple of Dendera at Egypt, it is shown as an unclean carrion bird standing on a serpent. And the name given in the Dendera zodiac, Bashti Beki. Bashti means confounded, confused. Beki, failing. The brightest star in this constellation are Nebo, the enemy of him who comes. The Arabic name for it, Arnebeth, is the same. Two other bright stars in it, Nebo, the mad or insane, and Sujia, the deceiver. Another constellation shown in all these ancient zodiacs <coughs> is a river flowing out from the downcoming foot of Orion where he's stepping on the head of the enemy serpent. Eridanus, the river of the judge. It's an immensely long constellation. The ancients always said this was a river of fire. Well, you have to go clear over to the book of Revelation, the latest book of the New Testament, to find this. Oh, no. There's reference to it there, but you will pick it up earlier in Daniel. Daniel 7, verses 9 to 10. I beheld until the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened the river of fire of the judge. Going on to the tenth constellation of the zodiac, Gemini, the twins, is the least clear as to its meaning. The Greeks claim to have in invented this constellation of Gemini, the twins, and it is entirely possible that the more ancient form of it has been lost because oh you can interpret it but with less certainty the Greeks called these twins Apollo and Hercules the Latins called them Castor and Pollux the Dendera Zodiac named this sector of the Zodiac Clostrum Hor the place of him who comes now, in the Dendera Zodiac, it shows two figures walking toward you. The second of the two figures, not sketched too clearly, but looks as though it might be a woman. The ancient Coptic name for this constellation, Pimahi, the United. The Hebrew name, Thamim, meaning United, and the Arabic name, Al-Talman, again meaning 
united. Now the den of the zodiac showed these two figures walking toward you, but most ancient drawings of the zodiac show two seated figures side by side. The one on the left has a club in his right hand, not brandishing it ready to strike, just merely holding it. A few of the old drawings show him with a palm branch rather than the club, but most of them show the club. A star in his left foot is called Alhenna, the hurt or afflicted. Remember that wounded heel. The figure on the right carries a harp in his right hand and a bow and arrows in his left hand. And again, not with the bow out ready to shoot, he's just merely carrying it. In his knee is a star called Mebsuta, meaning treading underfoot. Now both of these figures are simply resting. They're neither in action nor preparing for action. You might say resting after victory. Significance, we can't with too great certainty say. It could be a reference to Jesus Christ's two natures. Man who fought evil but was wounded and God who conquered. You remember you find in the centaur Again, a pretty obvious reference to the two natures. As the centaur was part man, part beast, so Jesus Christ was part God, part man. In this same segment with Gemini are two constellations, Canis Major and Canis Minor, the great dog and the lesser dog. In Canis Major, the star at the tip of his nose is Sirius, meaning the prince. The Akkadian name for it was Cassista, leader of the heavenly host. Other stars in it, Wesson, the shining, Adhara, the glorious, Ascari, meaning who shall come, and the Arabic name Al-Shira al jaminia the prince of the right hand. Now, Canis Minor, in the Dendera Zodiac, it bears the name Sibak, meaning conquering. The Dendera Zodiac does not show it as a dog. It shows it as a human figure with a hawk's head and a hawk's tail. Remember, one of their Egyptian gods was so shown. The brightest star in Canis Minor is Procyon, meaning Redeemer. Other bright stars in it, Al-Shira al the prince of the left hand, Al-Mirzam, the ruler, and Al-Gomera, he who perfects. Compare any of these with any of the ancient pagan religions, and we have a pretty good idea of all of them. And any of these constellations make no sense at all. They have no significance. Compare these with the Christian religion, and you can see where all of these fit in. Now remember, these were people living in a desert land, no smog, no fog, clear, bright light nights when all these stars were brilliant they would be looking at the stars and the idea was that all down through these centuries looking at the stars they'd recognize these constellations and have a reminder of the thing that was eventually going to be explained in greater detail in the Bible the eleventh of the constellations is Cancer the crab now, in the Zodiac of Dendera, it's shown as a scarab, the sacred beetle of the Egyptians. To the Egyptians, the scarab was a symbol of resurrection and immortality. 
<coughs> originally it was just a grub worm. And then it went into this pupa resting stage, apparently dead. And then out of it hatched this winged beetle that could fly off into the air. So they said that this was a symbol that out of death comes resurrection and renewed life. So, not a crab, but the scarab was shown there. The same is true of the zodiac in the Egyptian temple at Esme, and it's also found in a Hindu zodiac of about 400 B.C. Now, it's true that later Egyptian zodiacs used the crab. In the Dendera zodiac, however, they gave it a name, claria, meaning cattle folds, a corral into which cattle are driven for safekeeping at night. The Arabic name for this constellation was al-Sartan, he who holds. Now, there is no word for crab in Hebrew. Crabs were unclean things that they didn't even dignify with a name. In the Aramaic, which is closely related to Hebrew, the name given to this constellation was Sartano, meaning who holds. The Greek karkinos, holding or encircling. Now, of course, all these would be true of the cattle or sheep fold where the animals are pinned up for safekeeping at night. The brightest star in it, tegmine, meaning holding. Another, akubene, meaning sheltering or hiding place. Both Hebrew and Aramaic, the same on that. Another, Arabic, ma'alaf, meaning assembled thousands. And another Arabic name, another star in it, al Himarain, the kids or lambs. So you have then the fold where the sheep are assembled for safekeeping. Now close to this <coughs> are two minor constellations. Ursa Major and 